Of invited myself to come. <laughs> I, I told Martha that I was here uh, for the association meeting. At the time, I didn't even realize it was going to be here at West End, and, um, but I was going to be in the Halifax area. And um, I'm not sure who uh, opened the door a crack about possibly speaking at West End, but I jumped through it pretty fast, and Leslie graciously <laughs> has uh, given me this opportunity this morning. And and then I suddenly realized, oh my gosh, what am I going to speak on? <laughs> what, do I, what do I speak on here? And, and when I was speaking with Leslie earlier last week, and, and he was just telling me again about the involvement that this congregation has had with uh, newcomers recently and uh, former refugees who are, who are now here in Canada. <laughs> uh, Figuring, figuring life out in, in, a, in a totally new place after so much history. And, and your work with international students and the changing demographics of the Quinpole area and West End and the changing demographics of the church and your desire to, to be a diverse group of people, a unified and diverse group of people. Um, I, I thought to myself, maybe I should stay away, <laughs> not, not mess with this, this sounds pretty good. Um, but Martha mentioned about, we, we have a sort of a, a department or a focus in Canadian Baptist of Atlantic Canada called Intercultural Ministries, and we said that our, our goal is to further a movement of cross-cultural hospitality, because it, it's, it's a God movement, it, it's, it's God, it, that's his heart. Um, his reconciling heart, and so we want to further a movement of cross-cultural hospitality and seeing people come together who shouldn't be together. And I think, wow, what are, what are those people doing together? <laughs> because it's God, our Father, who brings us together. And I, I think probably the uh, one message that the Lord might deliver through me to, to you today is that this is a very, very, very hard thing. It, it is going against the natural laws of this universe. Um, possibly not the most um, primitive laws of the universe, but certainly from the curse, which is from this chapter of Genesis that we read, that things fall apart. And, you know, that's the second law of thermodynamics. And, you know, this universe is moving apart and, 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 and disintegration. And, 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 and we, right at a relational level, right at a personal level, we, we experience it. We, we have that saying, you know, I'm losing it. <laughs> I'm losing it. It's getting loose. <laughs> and, uh, and, and in our relationships, and we, Kelly and I have been listening to a song by a, a man called Andrew Peterson. I don't know if, it's, if you've used any of his stuff here, but he's quite a poet, and uh, this is one of his songs. The song's called, Is, is, he, is he Worthy? And, and it's, the lines are, Do you feel the world is broken? We do. Do you feel the shadows deepen? We do. But do you know all the darkness can't stop the light from shining through? We do. You wish you could see it all made new. We do. Is all creation groaning? It is. Is the glory of the Lord, oh sorry, is, is a new creation coming? It is. 
Is the glory of the Lord to be the light in our midst? It is. Is it good to remind ourselves of this? It is. And perhaps that's my role this morning, is to remind ourselves. Yes, it's hard. Yes, it seems like you're going against the grain and the natural order of things. Chaos seems to abound and brokenness. And, but to remind us that it has been fully experienced by God, fully as he said, since the children are flesh and blood, he too shared in their humanity, and he died. He disintegrated, and he resurrected. It's all going to be made new. And we as his people, living by faith, in our, still in our disintegrating bodies, and in a disintegrating world, by faith, are windows to a coming kingdom. And saying, we're going to see things that shouldn't happen. We're going to see people coming together who shouldn't be together. And um, and, and, and there's a lot of people, as Leslie mentioned in his prayer, who are lonely. And we know it in ourselves, don't we? Exile and homesickness is the story of humanity. You know, the book of Genesis, it's, it's and I, I believe you've been in Genesis. And, and, I'm, and I'm, I'm sure Leslie's mentioned this, that it's, Genesis, is, it's like, it's DNA material. It's, it's, um, it, it, it's, it's embryotic. It, 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 it's, it's the seed of the whole narrative of human history and human destiny. It's all there in seed form in, in um, Genesis. And, and, and we see it in this passage. Banishment. Exile. Driven out. Away from home. And that story is the story of humanity. And you see it played out all through the centuries. And right away in the scriptures you see it. Cain, their first son, driven out. Jacob, or Abraham, a wanderer. Jacob, his son, an exile running from home. Joseph, an exile sent away from home. Israel in Egypt. Israel in Assyria. Israel in Babylon. Israel scattered. Israel in exile. J Jesus, Mary, Joseph. Exiles. From Nazareth to Bethlehem, from Bethlehem to Egypt, from, from Egypt back to Nazareth. John, the, the, the author of the last book of the Bible, he wrote it in exile on the island of Patmos. It's the story of humanity, and, and we see it played out. There are 300 million people in the world, migrants, who are not living at home. And uh, one migrant in Shediac, New Brunswick, said, loneliness is our biggest enemy. Loneliness is our biggest enemy. But it's not just people who have physically been either pulled away from home or driven away from home, pushed away from home like refugees. Um, we all, you can be a long-term resident of Canada and, and feel homesick, feel like I'm lonely feeling like I'm not where I should be, I'm not who I should be. And, and you know, in, in a Genesis account, you have Adam and Eve suddenly feeling naked. Naked and ashamed. And, and when, we're, when we feel naked, when we feel lonely, when we feel exposed, and we, we do two things, we hide and we hurt. We see Adam and Eve sowing fig leaves, trying to hide. We, we, we insulate ourselves and we isolate ourselves. We withdraw. Um, and, we, and we see them hurting. We see Adam turning on Eve. <laughs> this woman you gave me. <laughs> we, we, we deflect. <laughs> we deflect our, our insecurity onto others. 
and they're a lot worse than me. And we start pointing fingers. We, we, we hide and we hurt. And though we, we started out in a garden with just incredible vulnerability and incredible oneness and at-homeness, um, but even in the garden, you know, the banishment didn't start in that passage we read when God drove them out. The exile started before. And um, when, they, when, when Adam and Eve stopped trusting, stopped living in incredible, just blind trust of, of, of their creator and from just living from their heart, doing whatever they pleased because they just lived in perfect communion and trust. And, 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 and they opted, instead of trusting, they opted for thinking, the knowledge of good and evil. Instead of living from our heart, we're gonna, we want to live from our head. And we want to we make independent choices and determine what's good and what's right and for me. But you know, we long to get back to the garden. We don't want to live from our head. We want to live. We want to be wholer than that. We want to just live. We just want to be, just live from our heart. And, 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 and uh, to get back to the garden, to get back to that tree of life. And, um, but, but there's a sword. There's a sword flashing back and forth. Sure death. And, and uh, we all have a sure death <laughs> ahead of us. And uh, some people, and, and our biggest fear about, that, about death is that it's the ultimate <laughs> homelessness. That, 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 that it, it'll be the ultimate banishment. It'll be the ultimate exile. That's our biggest fear. That this story is just going to continue and, and get even worse. And, uh, and some people like in our modern age would say, well, maybe it's just oblivion. That's, that's our best, the best scenario we can come up with, is that it's oblivion. But whether people are uh, religious or non-religious, we can't we can't get rid of this hope, this, this attempt to get back home. And the religious who believe that there's a tree of life on the other side of the sword <laughs> try very hard to earn their way back to it. Um, that's how their life is spent. They deny, they sacrifice, and this is the way you should live <laughs> because on the other side of the sword, they're, they're hopefully, Will earn our will be worthy of getting back to that tree of life, and and the irreligious will say, "There's no tree of life on the other side of that sword. It's oblivion. The tree of life is here." Um, so denial and sacrifice is not necessary. It's just follow your desi follow your uh, desires and seize seize the day. God is the subject of this passage. It's not really the story of humanity. <laughs> it's the story of God. And the story of God is reconciliation and homecoming. If you read that passage in Genesis, it's, it's, God is in full control. He's not taken by surprise. Um, he is the subject of all the sentences. God did this. God did that. God, God is in total control. And, uh, and you might say, Wait a second, God, it doesn't sound like God's all about reconciliation. <laughs> Isn't God the one driving them out of the garden and putting the sword and the angels, the cherubim? He sounds, you know, he seems very... Uh, he, <laughs> you know, I think it's too, it's too often... I, I just talked about not pointing the finger, so I'm not going to. <laughs> but, but it seems like he's deporting people and building walls, doesn't it? <laughs> um, that's the kind of leader he seems to be at this moment. But there's method to his madness. He says, he gives a reason for his madness, for this 
you know, extreme um, actions of his. He says, humanity has now become like one of us, knowing good and evil. They must not be allowed to reach out their hand and take also from the tree of life and live in this state forever. Because to, 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 we, we, he wants us to get back to that home. He doesn't want us to live forever by our own wits. He wants us to get back to who we truly are with him, in relationship with him. He doesn't want us to be homesick forever. And, and you see this through all of the examples. Cain was given a mark. Yes, you're banished, Cain, but there's hope. I'm, I don't know what that mark was. But he's, Jacob is, is in exile. Nothing. Sleeps with his head on a rock for a pillow, but there's a wife waiting for him at a well. Joseph in prison in Egypt, but all of a sudden he's given a position of authority. Israel's given land. John on the island of Patmos is given a vision. The dwelling of God is now with man. And um, refugees know this. God has a plan. Despite exile, God has a plan. It, it actually gets, it can get turned around in a hurry. Uh, all the brokenness and, uh, and the loneliness. It, and a lot of refugees have experienced this. Yesterday there was a pastor here, uh, Ejigu Haile, an Oromo pastor. He's a pastor over in Spryfield. Um, he pastored a church in Ifo refugee camp in Kent, northern Kenya where we lived. And, and um, we, he wasn't that, he's planted the church, um, but when we were there in, in the 90s attending the church, he'd already moved on to Nairobi. But uh, and now he lives in Halifax. And, and every member of that church, their testimony was, I came to know God as my, as my home in, through the refugee experience. I wasn't a Christian before, but through the refugee experience, through this incredible exile, I, I came to get something I could never lose. Home I could never lose. Security I could never lose. Protection I could never lose. Um, it's a story of many refugees. So God's in full control of this reconciliation, and, and he pays the full cost of it. In this Genesis passage, it starts with this little thing that says God clothed Adam and Eve with garments of skin. He gave them garments of skin and clothed them. He made garments of skin and clothed them. And um, he, he said your efforts aren't, will never do. You, your efforts to get home will never do. Your efforts to cover up the nakedness and, and, and the shame will never do. Let me clothe you. And um, this, this, of course, is the first death. Garments of skin, an animal. This is the first death in paradise, in the garden. And of course, it's a foreshadowing. It's a prophecy of, of the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Since the children are flesh and blood, he too is going to share their humanity so that by his death, he might free those who all their lives have been held in slavery to death. And this is the most amazing part of the story, how quickly it can turn around you think, how are they going to get past that sword? How are they going to get back to the tree of life? No one saw this coming. That God was going to come to this side of the sword. That God, that God was going to take on flesh. That God was going to live, come and live as a, as, as a person. The life that we couldn't live. He lived in perfect homeness with his father on earth the way it was meant to be. He lived it. He lived in perfect communion. He lived from his heart. 
he, he walked with his father. And he, he lived the life we only can dream of. He died the death we dread. He faced ultimate banishment. He faced ultimate exile. The exile that God was trying to spare us from, lest we reach out and take it in this present form. He faced that. Adam and Eve, you, you, you know, this, this, these verses in, in Genesis, they're some of the saddest verses. Like, we, they resonate with us, don't they? Exile, banishment. But they're not the saddest verses in the Bible. I think the saddest verses is when God himself, who, who is at home for eternity, cried out, my God, my God. Why have you banished me? Why, why am I exiled? Why, why have you forsaken me? Adam and Eve, Adam and Eve got clothed in the garden and then banished. Jesus was stripped naked and bound to the cross. Adam and Eve disobeyed in the garden but yet God came to them calling, where are you? Jesus Christ obeyed in the garden. Not my will, but your will. But he, was, he ended up having to call out, where are you? It's, it's, we, we've sang it all morning in all the songs about this relationship that we can have how at home we can be. Um, personally, what does this mean for me? What can it mean for us? Personally, the biggest thing it's, it's meant lately is stop, Paul. Stop. Stop trying. Stop trying to earn your way back to that tree. <laughs> it, it, the tree of life actually comes to us. God actually comes to us. That's been a word to me lately. Stop. Just stop. Just, I, I've been trying to just sit in God's presence and be silent and realize that he's God and I don't have to be. And I don't have to. It's not up to me. It's, it's, it, he, he is the one who reconciles. And just to let him clothe me. And... In, in, in the garden, a long time later, Mary grabbed onto Jesus and held him and hugged him. And Jesus said, Mary, you've got to let me go because I'm going back to my father. So tell my brothers, tell everyone. Because he'd said, if I go, if I return, I will send the Holy Spirit to you. And um, we, we need to stop and we need to sigh. And, and just feel those, the, 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 his righteousness being wrapped around us. And, um, and, 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 and it's not just a clean slate. It's, he said, I don't, I never do that. He said, I fill the house. I, I don't just clean it. And uh, we, we, we personally, every day, need to, need to be still, be clothed, and, and know that we are his children indeed. And, um, and corporately, you must not hide as a church, and you must not hurt as a church. You must, we can be ourselves. We can, we can be strong and weak at the same time. We, we, our God came to us. We need to go to people in their chaos, in their abandonment, in their exile, and suffer with them. There's no way around it. It's, 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 it's hard. And to die with them. And um, never, 
never give up an opportunity to build relationships with other churches, with, with, with people in the neighborhood. This, this is what has been bought for us, relationship, reconciliation. And I, I know that God, God has humbled all of us as churches uh, in, in the West, it seems. But when we get back to the essence of our relationship with him and, and, and that he's calling us into relationships with others to, and, and to, to go, not wait for people to come to us. God didn't wait for us to work our way past that sword. He came on our, to our side. And uh, so may God bless you as you join people's lives um, in this neighborhood. Um, and, and, and I've just been so encouraged by what this church has been doing with refugee families and, and other newcomers and, and students. And I, I ask God's blessing on you as, as you continue to walk out your faith.